Okay, thank you for joining us again. Uh, today is the eighth webinar in our TEDN webinar series. Uh, it's entitled An Introduction to Microphysiological Systems. It's being presented today by Dr. Megan LaFollette, who is the program manager for the North American 3Rs Collaborative. As usual, please use the GoToWebinar question submission box on your control panel to submit questions to Dr. LaFollette today. Um, we will try to address all the questions at the end of our Q&A, at, at our Q&A session. Um, so please feel free to submit questions while they're fresh in your mind, and, and we will get to them at the end. If something pressing does come up, I, I will interrupt Dr. LaFollette, um, but otherwise we'll, we'll hold them until the end. Uh, before I turn the presentation over to Megan, I just want to uh, briefly share Megan's information with you. Dr. LaFalla uh, works as the program manager for the North American 3Rs Collaborative to advance science, innovation, and research animal welfare. Megan has her PhD in animal behavior and well-being from Purdue University, where she also received a Master of Science in Animal Welfare. Her primary interests lie at the intersection of human and animal interaction and animal welfare, especially in practical refinements for laboratory and companion animals. Um, her interests have, have led uh, to her conducting projects focused on rat tickling, compassion fatigue in laboratory animal personnel, refinement for cats in confinement, positive reinforcement in training horses, the welfare of service dogs, and human behavior change for animal welfare. Dr. LaFollette has, uh, for many years, I think now been, been a part of our webinar series. Uh, it's presented on, on numerous topics, and her, her presentations are, are very uh, well received each time. So we're delighted that she is back here with us today to present on today's topic. So please bear with us as I turn the presentation control over to Dr. LaFollette. Awesome, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I'll just wait for the notification to share my screen. And you all should see it now. Okay. Awesome. So some of you may be wondering after, especially after Tom read that bio, why am I talking about microphysiological systems? After all, my PhD is in animal behavior and welfare. I typically focus on whole animal systems. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's my background. But I organize a initiative with the North American 3Rs Collaborative that focuses on microphysiological systems. And in some ways, the fact that I do not have a PhD in this area, I am not a trained microphysiological system scientist, I think makes it easier for me to communicate to many about what are very complex systems in a way that is understandable. And really importantly, um, and how I'm really able to do this, is the wonderful team um, of the Microphysiological Systems Initiative. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the members, especially these members in bold on the left, who worked with me on this presentation extensively, um, made sure I knew what I was talking about, um, provided figures, provided diagrams, provided data. Um, and so that's one thing that I think will make this presentation pretty exciting, is it it's a really broad view from a lot of different providers, a lot of different organs, um, and so I think that'll that'll be exciting for everyone. So, but I like, you know, if you've ever done a webinar with me, I think it's always good to start big picture and think about what we're really doing in this field. Um, we mostly enter this field. Um, we're working in animal research um, or in microphysiological systems research. We're working in science generally to answer um, questions that we have about humans or animals. We want to solve problems related to health, disease, function, and ultimately help both people and animals. And we all want to apply the three R's to the work. Um, I think that's something to always acknowledge, you know, whether we are focused in animal research, whether we're focused um, in, in, vivo, in vitro systems, um, we're all interested in this. We all want to do more. 
But it is really important um, that when we're thinking about replacing animals, that we're doing it with technologies when it's truly scientifically appropriate. Um, it's not easy um, to design a replacement, to have a replacement um, that truly has validation, um, that truly can replace um, at least some aspects of animal research. But I'm very convinced that microphysiological systems um, can do this to some degree. And this is really important, microphysiological systems, because as we all know, um, animal research faces a lot of challenges. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the translation problem, the reproducibility problem, how expensive research is, how the public doesn't always accept what we do. I think most of us on the webinar um, today are fairly familiar that these problems exist um, and that we're all trying to address them. And they're really big, hairy, complex problems. Um, they're not things, translation, reproducibility, cost, acceptance. There's not just one thing um, that we can do to solve them. They're very complex. There's lots of different inputs. We at the NA3RC truly believe that applying the three R's are part of the solution, but there's more um, to them. But for reproducibility and translation in particular, um, we believe that part of the problem, at least in part, is due to experimental design, um, lack of standards in some, in some cases, and the choice of model. And this is important because of course, not all of our animal research. Some of our animal research is focused basic. Some of it is for that particular animal species. But the large majority of our animal research, we hope, is going to eventually impact the human population. Um, and so, and we're trying to do this starting with our animal models for good ethical reasons. But this is really challenging at times. And just an example of when, um, just one of many examples um, where this can be particularly challenging is in predicting liver toxicology. And the reason or part of the reason that we figured out that this is so difficult is because there's really high species specificity in the liver. Five of the seven most important drug metabolizing, metabolizing enzymes are different um, between human and animal models. How we process um, and how we process drugs in our liver is different from animals. And the ones that are the same only metabolize about 5% of drugs. Um, so this, there's just not this conservation of processes across animal species. Um, and so this is, this is a real problem. This is something that, um, you know, we put drugs through animals. We think they're going to be fine. We don't think there's going to be um, liver toxicology. We go into clinical trials. They end up failing or later, um, even post a approval, we see additional problems and drugs then get pulled from market. Um, so it's, it, is, it is a big problem. And this is just one example. Again, there's lots of ways where animal research isn't perfect, where it struggles to really replicate what's going on in the human body. But this is one example. And in part of because of this difficulty with translation, we all know that developing new drugs is costly, it's time intensive, and it's difficult. Um, one in 10,000 compounds that start um, will actually make it all the way through the process to an FDA approved drug. Each drug is estimated to cost about $2 billion to develop. It traditionally takes over 15 years, um, and only about three in 10 approved drugs really generate revenue that covers above and beyond the research and development costs. Um, so this is a big this is a big issue in the field. And when we look at why things fail. It's not for operational reasons. It's not because we couldn't market them. It's generally not because, um, you know, for strategic reasons, the company decided not to pursue them. Primarily, it's due to both efficacy and safety. And this is, you know, this is looking at this um, clinical failure. And the safety failures that we see in the clinic, this, this failure is important because that means that likely we're not just 
missing real human safety concerns in our models, but we're also likely rejecting really good drug candidates because they didn't work in animals, but they might really work well in humans. Um, and so this is, this is where um, we want to address. Um, and all of this really, this failure really suggests that we could benefit from improvement in our preclinical models. Um, this is again, not to say that animal research is not important, that it isn't very necessary in today's current structure, but it could be better. Um, this is what science is all about. It's all about moving forward, figuring out what's a better model, what's a better process, refining, and microphysiological systems um, is what we think is a key application of the three R's um, and a true commitment to this continuous scientific progress that I think we're all committed to. So just in case you haven't heard of us, I do wanna talk briefly about what the North American Through Arts Collaborative is. We're a nonprofit um, that's mission is to advance science, innovation, and research animal welfare. And we do this through collaborative Three R's efforts. Um, we partner with individuals across the field. Um, this is a picture of just our leadership team and our board of directors. And I hope that you can appreciate it includes people from industry, academia, other nonprofits, um, bio, like biomedical research, um, all sorts of different institutions. Um, and we identify initiatives and really work together um, to figure out what's working, what's not working, how can we help others. And what our strategy is, is to identify key evidence-based 3Rs approaches, address the barriers to them, and promote them as everyday practice. And when we're looking for initiatives, we're really looking for what we believe are the three three critical things um, in three in real world three R's applications. We want to see strong scientific evidence that this three R's technique um, is actually beneficial, that it works, um, et cetera, not just from one paper or one study in one institution, um, but ideally from a variety. We want to see high impact. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that maybe would improve animals' lives or would improve the three R's a little bit, but we want to see things that are going to really improve a lot of animal lives, like total, or maybe as fewer animals' lives, but in a big way. And then finally, and extremely importantly, we also look at the practicality of the three R's applications. Of course, we all probably know there's a lot of things that we could do that would immensely improve the welfare of our research animals that would improve our experiments and we could maybe replace them. But some of these things simply are not practical in today's real world biomedical research, um, animal research field. So what we ideally want to see when we're identifying initiatives is we wanna see multiple institutions that have applied this three R's technique across their entire institution. Again, not just one lab or one particular group that maybe has, you know, extremely high um, amount of input of time, money, et cetera, and they can do it, but we wanna see that an entire institution can do it um, before we recommend it to the, the rest of the field, that we can see that it truly is something that a whole institution can move to. So that's really what we're looking for. And we currently have six key three R's initiatives. We focus on rodent health monitoring, specifically encouraging the replacement of live sentinel rodents with environmental health monitoring techniques. Of course, microphysiological systems, these are our two replacement focused initiatives. We also focus on translational digital biomarkers, which are ways to assess animals within their home cages non-invasively. That's really focused more on both reduction and refinement. We have a refinement initiative. We spoke earlier this year for the 3R seminar series about refined handling of mice via tunnels or cupping. We're currently developing a 3R certificate course that should be released um, later this year. And then um, I'm also very proud about our Compassion Fatigue Resiliency um, 
program that we're actually in the middle of running a longitudinal pilot study um, looking at um, implementation of institutional compassion fatigue resiliency programs and we're helping institutions to establish those. But anyways, that's super brief. Just wanted to make sure that you guys knew what we were up to today. And now I'm gonna focus back on our, our talk in particular, and that's our microphysiological systems initiative. And what we're really seeking to do is increase adoption of these systems, as well as regulatory acceptance of these systems in coordination of animal studies. And our MPS group is unique because it's situated in an organization that truly recognizes the value and necessity of animal research. Um, we are truly committed to advancing all three R's. You look, if you saw our initiative list, we aren't just focused on replacement, we're also focused on refinement. Um, we really are supportive of animal research. We just think that this is something else um, that needs to be focused on as well. We're also unique because we focus specifically on working with developers with commercially available systems. So these are companies, these are technology providers who actually have systems that are ready to go, that a end user, whether they're pharma, potentially academic, can go to this developer, can purchase, and can start using relatively soon. And these developers, we believe, are in a key position to guide and assist MPS use and acceptance. The reason for this is that they are so intimately knowledgeable about these technologies that they understand both the promise and the limitations. They know what these technologies can do. They know what these technologies cannot do. And they're also always doing tailored research and development in the background. So they're often very forward thinking. But again, thinking about that practicality aspect, we're not just working with academics that are in the very early stages of MPS development. Certainly most of these companies have partnerships with academic institutions and that research is critical but it's not quite, it doesn't quite meet that practical importance that we look for, um, that, you know, this is ready to go. We have 40 different institutions that are part of this initiative. Um, 28 of those are developers, and you can see all of their logos here. Um, we also have a few end users um, and some consultants um, a couple, and a couple additional um, individuals as well. We focus on four key efforts. Um, interfacing with end users, we actually have an MOU in place with the IQ MPS affiliate, um, and we do webinars and workshops um, for their members. So if you're a member of the IQ MPS affiliate, hopefully you've seen those communications, um, and I'll just highlight what our next ones will be. Um, we also focus on regulatory acceptance. We're writing two papers right now that are overviewing the field, as well as looking at suggesting what guidance MPS developers need from regulators to move forward. We have a technology expo where you can search for technology providers that I'll highlight at the end of the talk. And then of course we have an education group, which is the group that really helped me put today's presentation together. Um, they're also focused on conferences and really spreading the word about what we're doing. So I do want to mention, um, in case there are members of the IQ Consortium online right now, um, that we are hosting a series of MPS webinars and workshops. And how these webinars and workshops work is that webinars are, um, we say, developer agnostic. They really are broad overview about MPS, but focused on a very particular system. Um, so, for example, for liver. And then our workshops are where we actually bring those companies in to talk about their specific um, systems and where their systems maybe have benefits, limitations, et cetera. Um, we just wrapped those up. We had them last week, our first set of um, workshops on liver. It was really interesting to hear from developers, um, kind of like animal models, you know, the difference between using a mouse versus a non-human primate. In some ways, there's um, similar complexity with MPS as well. There's some systems where, um, you know, they're really high throughput, you can do a lot with them. There's some that are um, less high throughput, more difficult to develop, you can't have as many of them um, that you can do more with. And so um, it's, it's interesting to hear about all the different options as well. 
Our second set of um, webinars and workshops will be on neuro, CNS, and PNS NPFs. The webinar is going to be in late April, and the workshops either going to be actually in mid-May or um, mid-June, depending on it. So all of that is kind of a little bit of background on, you know, why are we even talking about NPS? What does our group do? And how can you find out more? But what exactly are microphysiological systems? I myself <laughs> had to have quite a few talks with the developers to really understand what um, this terminology encompasses. Some people may use the term organ on a chip, but that's actually a more limited terminology than microphysiological systems. But what I'm talking about is I'm talking about systems that are miniaturized, so they are quite small. Um, they also mimic the physiology of tissues, organs, or organ systems in terms of function, cellular metabolism, and or cellular dynamics. They also contain major organ-specific cell types that are arranged in a similar fashion to human organs or animal organs, depending on what the MPS is doing, that allow for cell-cell interactions. They're grown from a variety of different cell types and sources. You can use primary, cell primary cells, cell lines, induced pluripotent stem cells from either healthy or diseased donors. They can truly model both healthy or diseased tissues, and they can be viable for, in some systems, up to three months. Um, so they cover a lot of different things. They've actually been created for almost every organ um, in the human body, as well as many disease states. There's also been quite a few of them developed um, for many of our animal models, um, rat, non-human, some of the non-human primates, um, a couple different um, animal NPS have been created as well. This is a couple examples of what they can look like. So on the left, you can see this is a functional human-derived 3D neurospheroid that actually has neurons and astrocytes in it. And I want to, I wonder, oops, I was going to say I had a video in here that I might have to, here we go. So you can actually see this neurospheroid. It's really actually composed a neural network, and it's that neural network is pulsing, which is pretty exciting. This one in the middle is actually a perfused functional liver model of human drug metabolism using terminally differentiating HEPA-RG cells. And the one on the right is perfused breast microtumor composed of primary human cells. They also have some that are grown on uh, actual chips um, that have flow, most of them have flow through them. Um, there's a lot of different options for how you can actually do these. Um, in terms of what our initiative member is covering, we actually have 17 different organs or organ systems. Um, this is a list of them. I'm not going to read through them all, but the number in the parentheses is the number of different um, providers that offer that specific um, that specific organ or organ system. And so hopefully you can appreciate how diverse these are and how for even just one system, there can be a lot of different ways to look at it um, using MPS. Further, MPS have been linked together to form multi-organ systems. Um, there's actually in our group 10 commercially available systems. And this is really excited, exciting because these multi-organ systems are able to capture some systemic effect that cannot be captured by any other in vitro system at the moment and are wholly reserved for in vivo systems. Um, so this can show, you know, this is how the gut, you know, is going to um, interact with the liver tissue, is going to interact with lung tissue, brain tissue, etc. You can even add a peripheral, a peripheral nervous system to this and innervate the MPS and string them together. Um, there's a lot that you can do for this. Um, I will say, and I want to, again, I, these are very promising systems. They're not everything. This, this does not mean that they can recapitulate and therefore replace all important features of these organs or a full body experiment. Um, they're not the end all be all, but they can replace some features of an experiment and they can give us human relevant data um, that might actually be more applicable um, to our human subjects. 
MDS usage can also be relatively practical. Again, going back to that aspect, um, it can be scalable. Um, often these like neurospheroids can be um, in a 96 well plate, so you can have many, many replicates of it. Um, they're often can be available on demand. Like I said, we're working with developers that can get these systems going pretty quickly. And they also work, again, similar to animal research, where you can either, some um, groups allow you to purchase their MPS and do the experiments yourself, and some of them operate as CROs, um, where they will actually run the experiments for you, um, as, you know, and it just depends on the institution. They're also used in a diverse range of contexts of use. Um, so basically this means they are used for many different things. This is just our initiative internal um, data, but you can see whether they're used for drug safety, target identification, drug efficacy, pharmacokinetics and pharmacology, clinical development, compound optimization. They can be used for a lot of different contexts. And they do show translational promise. And I think that this, this part of the presentation is very exciting to see. You can see that they can recapitulate important aspects of um, whether human or animal systems. They can be really good for toxicity. And they can even replicate, um, look at disease replication and efficacy. So first, let's talk a little bit about recapitulation. So MPS have you know, if we're using a human MPS system, they're gonna have much more relevant gene expression to humans than other animals. Um, this figure shows gene expression in humans, in red, a full body. Um, MPS systems, the 3D cell culture in this blue line here, um, as well as um, a mouse model in green and in yellow, a 2D, a more traditional in vitro cell culture. Um, and you can see that when you're looking at the correlation coefficients, it's clearly much closer to use these 3D models more than mice and more than those 2D cell cultures. They can also recapitulate some aspects, um, some very important aspects of organ morphology. So these are slides of a brain MPS and a neuron MPS. And you can see that the neurons are arranged very precisely with the soma on one side and the axon on the other. This is polarized neuronal arrangement. Um, and you can see that this is very relevant to how our organs are arranged. And due to this, MPS can actually recapitulate even drug administration route, which is very different from traditional in vitro cell culture. So for example, again, if you're thinking about this um, neuron MPS, if you are testing an IV drug, you can apply it to the cell body versus if you're testing a drug that you want to administer dermally, you can apply it to the axon tip or terminal arrangement. And again, like this is, this is very relevant to how our bodies would actually experience um, the drug to be applied. This also can occur in our multi-organ systems. So if we link different MPS together, we can again see, okay, if we have an oral drug, we can put it directly in a gut MPS, see how the gut is gonna process that, send it out to other organs and see how it flows. Versus the IV drug, we can apply um, kind of directly in between the different organs. They can also be really used um, successfully um, to recapitulate human immune systems. Um, so if you're working with immune related diseases, um, many mouse models are immune deficient and not similar to humans. So we might add human immune cells, but these could be normal. They couldn't, they might not be diseased. Um, you know, it's, it's not quite the same thing. It also takes a long time. It's a very expensive. Whereas if we're developing an MPS and we're looking at immune function, we can actually take the immune cells and tumor cells from the same patient, from the same individual so that they match, maybe they're diseased as well, and look at um, a variety of different things with this MPS directly, um, which has clear advantages for the scientific process. They also show really great um, translational promise in terms of toxicity. So MPS are actually quite good at predicting toxicity. 
this is a series of graphs that I think are really great because they're relatively simple to understand, um, but also tell this good story. This is from a validated retinal organoid model. Um, and on the left hand side, we can see a non cytotoxic drug. And on the right hand side, we're going to see a cytotoxic drug. On the x-axis, you can see an increasing concentration of those drugs, and on the y-axis is the viability of it. So you can see with this non-cytotoxic drug that this retinal MPS remains viable at all concentrations, even after 72 hours of incubation with this compound. On the flip side, if we look at a known cytotoxic drug, we can see the cell's viability decrease in a dose-dependent manner. Um, so it's not just, you know, this drug is toxic or not, but maybe it's not so toxic at very low concentrations, but as it goes up, you're gonna see more and more toxicity. And this actually took place over 24 hours because it's a quite toxic drug. But not only can an MPS just say a particular drug is toxic or not, and how much at different concentrations, but you can actually see this is a graph where you're looking at the percent of live drugs across a range of drugs. Um, this is for a liver MPS where 159 different compounds were tested, and they had 49 um, that had evidence of cytotoxicity, and they could actually be ranked from least to most toxic. Um, and so you can see, okay, maybe some of these are better for efficacy, and maybe they're slightly toxic. You know, you can, you can look into this in quite a bit of detail with these systems. We see this as true for many different models. Um, one um, piece of information that was shared with me that I thought was particularly relevant as well is if you look at neural spheroids, that they're better right now than animal models look for looking at seizure liability um, for preclinical drugs with a specificity of over 85%. Um, that's just one example. Lots of the MPS are used for toxicity testing. Furthermore, MPS can even demonstrate um, when, when looking to identify potentially toxic compounds, they can look at what is the specific mechanism of, a, of actions of this compounds. So this is again going back to a slightly different um, neuro MPS. You can see in the figure that's on the screen right now that a, a control vehicle was replied. Um, you can see the... Um, one sec. You can see the um, neurons in green, you can see the myelin in red and the DAPI in blue. Um, but when no neurotoxins are applied, you can see disorganization, disorganization occurring. Um, but you don't just see that um, generally, but you can look at specifically. So on the left-hand side, you can see a drug that actually is microtubule targeted, and you can see that the myelination, that those mi microtubules were changed. Um, you can see that red diagram be very different. Whereas the DNA targeted drug, you can see the blue has become very disorganized. So this is exciting because MPS can answer more questions than just toxic or not, fixed or not. They can look at the mechanism. They're also very exciting in terms of disease replication and efficacy. So MBS can actually recapitulate disease-related phenotypes. So this is, again, a neuro-MPS example. Um, in here, you can actually see a control MPS that is healthy and a neuro-MPS that recapitulates critical aspects of rep disease. They, and if you look at different features of these neuro-MPS, you can see that they're different in terms of neuro, neuro, neurite outgrowth, synapse formation, and neural function. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can really look at these diseases. It's often diseases that haven't been super successful um, modeling in on animal models, and you can learn a lot more about them using these MPS systems. And due to these factors, MPS do really show translational promise. One way that MPS are already being used and where um, they're very, very promising is using them early in drug discovery. Um, and this can al allow you to decide which compounds you're gonna actually take into animals since animals are still required for FDA approval. 
So this is a you know, theoretical example where maybe you're looking at seven different compounds and you can apply them to your MPS, your healthy MPS, your diseased MPS. You can look at how much they rescue the diseased MPS. You can also look at different tox um, toxicity that may have. And based on these factors, you can very quickly eliminate the toxic compounds as well as eliminating, eliminating the compounds that just didn't rescue that disease phenotype. And then rather than trying all of these seven compounds in animals, you're just going to be trying two. And, and many companies are actually starting to do this. MPS can also drive successful clinical outcomes um, through patient-based um, discovery and stratification um, through truly personalized medicine. You can actually get um, patient-derived cells as MPS. Um, you can make MPS with that specific patient cells. You can screen compounds on a per-patient basis, looking at how much those drugs um, save and actually um, have functional endpoints for their MPS, and then determine whether those patients are going to benefit from which standard therapies that might be out there versus clinical trials. And MPS have actually already been used this way to increase patients' progression-free survival time. This is very exciting. This is the length of time that the person is living with a disease and it's not getting worse. This graph shows seven patients across 15 months. With traditional decision making, um, you know, just, okay, we're gonna look at you, the doctor's gonna try to figure out what they think they're, it's gonna work best their median progression-free survival time would only be two and a half months for this particular disease. But with MPS-aided decision-making, all patients' um, progression-free survival time more than doubled, and this one in white actually went beyond the study. They were still surviving without the disease getting worse um, based onto these, um, these decisions that were made with MPS, which is very, very exciting, especially for very aggressive diseases that have poor um, treatment right now in the clinic. They can also facilitate patient-derived xenograft work. Again, you can have this patient-derived tumor grown as an MPS. You can screen compounds per patient. And then you can only move drugs to in vivo work that show promise in MPS systems. In this way, you can really help reduce that animal use, save time, save money, and save people. This can work. Um, this is, again, some graphs showing that patient-derived xeno, xenograft comparing um, an ex vivo MPS and an in vivo. And basically, I'm not gonna go too into these graphs, but the in vivo response was replicated ex vivo for MPS across multiple models. Other important factors about MPS, they can have robust reproducibility. Um, this is looking at um, quality control results from 17 months of manufacturing batches. This is thousand of organized. This is just from one provider, but it shows that it can be done. And what you see is you see really tight um, spheroid diameter, baseline activity, pharmacology responses in terms of ion channels and key neurotransmitter responses. Um, and this is important because it demonstrates demonstrate stable cellular processes across manufacturing batches. We wouldn't want to recommend MPS as a solution for animal models or as a replacement if they weren't reproducible, um, since that's something we already struggle with our animal models with. And due to this factor, we really recommend MPS, especially right now, already being part of this quick win, fast fail drug development paradigm, where we're doing MPS testing early um, for internal portfolio decision making. And this is again just a graph where you or a table where you can see that um, groups are already doing this. Um, this is you can see in the column of end users, end users that are already working with MPS providers to screen drugs to decide what to move forward. Also, it's good to know that these currently developed MPS can take days or weeks to implement um, when you're looking at a new model system instead of months. They can often require less than animal models. Overall, MPS can be a key part of an ethical research portfolio through effective implementation of the three R's. But of course, again, I want to, people to know that they have limitations. They are not necessarily the end all be all. 
Currently, they're not fully accepted by regulators. Now, the agencies are very interested in MPS technologies, and there has been a lot of development in this area, but you can't um, really submit a brand new drug looking at just MPS data at this point. They're also clearly not appropriate for all paradigms. MPS are not going to replicate behavior. They, they can't behave in the same way a whole body organism can. And so for mental health issues, it's gonna be very difficult to use them. Also, since they're very small, we're not gonna be able to do things like modeling fractures of large bones or cardiac output. They also generally aren't shaped by external stimuli. You know, so much of our human health depends on our environment and environmental factors. And so we're not gonna see that um, in these models. And even though we do have these multi-organ um, 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 systems, their interactions are limited and we have to kind of understand already what's going on in order to make these interactions physiologically relevant. Despite that, we truly believe that microphysiological systems have advantages. They mimic human physiology, disease, toxicity, and efficacy, which you can also have animal MPS as well, so you can see what's happening in the animal MPS, the human MPS, and the preclinical animal model. They're scalable, they can be practical, they can replace animal use for the three R's, and they can save time and money. Overall, they can be a critical and ethical part of biomedical research's goal to help both people and animals. And like I said, they can really be integrated with animal studies. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both um, to further the field. And if you're interested more about MPS, we do have a small resource hub on our website. Um, and in particular, we have got this MPS technology hub where you can sort by organ system to find different providers, which are really the best place if you've got an organ specific question. If you're interested in learning more about what we do generally and staying up to date about um, opportunities like this webinar, whether it's MPS, um, refinement, compassion fatigue, all of those resources, I really encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We put it out about um, twice a month right now um, with those resources. We also have a podcast where we highlight the latest three R's research in just under three minutes. We have three papers, one minute each. It comes out once a month. It's a really great um, opportunity to learn about the three R's. And then I just have to put a call that if you love what we're doing, um, if you think what we're doing is great, that we would love to see either your institution become a member or for you to personally donate to the cause. We are a nonprofit. We do depend on your donations um, to do the work that we do. Um, so if you're looking for a place to put that money, we always appreciate that. And of course, I want to thank our current sponsors. They really support what we do. Um, they're so critical to our mission um, and also committed to the three R's that we really are happy to partner with them with our work. And of course, thank you also to our MPS initiative members. They're a critical part of this microphysiological systems. They work really hard to advance the field. Um, it's been great working with them over the past couple of years, and I'm excited to see where we go. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and answer any questions that people have, at least to the best of my ability, or get back to you. Um, and you can always visit our website to learn more. You can always email me with further questions as they may come up later as well. Thank you, Megan. Um, we'll give it a minute here uh, for some additional questions come in. Again, everyone, please feel free to utilize your GoToWebinar uh, question submission box, and, and we'll address some uh, some of the questions that you send in. Um, first question here: uh, Do you have any thoughts about how much more widely uh, microphysiological systems will be integrated uh, in the next five years? Yeah, I mean, I I can't like give a statistic or anything like that, but I think that we're only going to be seeing these systems being applied more and more in the um, in research overall, whether it's basic research, whether it's applied research, whether it's drug development, um, whether it's um, compound testing, that they're really, um, really exciting. And the technology has just come so far in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. And I think especially, you know, the regulators are taking an interest in this. Um, the end users are. I think it's. I think it's going to increase further and further um, as time goes on, and hopefully, we'll make our 
overall scientific research package better. Um, but I, I think that's, you know, it's still going to include animals, um, but, you know, MPS can do a lot as well. And especially for areas as well, one of the areas that the MPS also can be really good is those places where animal models just haven't worked. There's a lot of human diseases where our animal models, we just either just don't have one or whenever we've tried to develop one, it hasn't worked super well. It hasn't led to um, good outcomes in the clinic. And that's an area where MPS can also really shine, where there's just, you know, it's just not working in animals. Thank you. Um, don't want to put you on, on the spot. Um, question came in. Uh, what are your thoughts about NPS and the FDA Modernization Act that has been proposed by uh, members of Congress? <laughs> um, uh, I think that these are two. The, I think they are two very separate things. Um, I think NPS, and if you talk to the providers, especially the providers that work with us, the end users that are using them, they recognize that animal research is still necessary. Um, they don't think that, you know, we need to just, you know, totally move over to these, that we're, you know, we're having a great waste in animal research. Um, and so, you know, certainly maybe some of the individuals might support this act, but I think they're really separate questions, even though this Modernization Act may reference and hold up NPS systems as, you know, oh, we can do this, that we need to, to modernize. Um, <laughs> I don't, they're not really necessarily actually as an intertwined um, question as that. I don't know, Tom, if you, if you also want to weigh in on that as a or not. Oh, this is your talk, Megan. I think I can skip that one for now. <laughs> of course, of uh, course. <laughs> uh, it, it's um, uh, my comment would be I, I think there's a, a lot of uh, education that's needed for for members of Congress about the the role of animals and and the role of uh, replacement technologies and, and even uh, you know how they're integrated, but also the status of uh, or, or the state of their current development. Um, so yes. there, there's a lot of work left to do. That would be my yes. comment on that issue. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> uh, a question here. I've recently heard that MPS is more expensive than animal-based studies. Uh, your presentation indicates that uh, they can save time and money. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah. So it depends. It it you know, animal research can have a wide range of costs depending on whether you're using non-human primates or mice. Um, and so MPS can also have a wide range. So when I say it saves time and money, that depends on what you're looking at. But if we think about the big picture about, you know, not using these MPS at all early in drug development, taking a drug all the way through animals, thinking that it's going to work, thinking that it's not toxic and that it's safe, and then putting it into humans and having it, that's the first time it's ever been, um, you know, in like 3D human cells, and then it fails there. The fact that we can now use MPS early to figure that out before they go into animals that is huge amount of savings of time and money. And so it's not necessarily like, oh, I've got a mouse, a mouse study and a MPS. The MPS is always going to be cheaper than the mouse study. It's more thinking big picture, as well as often thinking also about like the non-human primate studies. You know, those are very expensive. We're having sourcing issues. Um, that's especially where, you know, if we can use these MPS, then in the large range, um, we truly, like I truly believe that it's gonna save um, the research pipeline time and money, but you can't necessarily look at that on just a mouse study versus MPS study kind of basis. Thank you. Um, I've got a bunch of comments here thanking you for the talk and, and the, the good content. Uh, my favorite being, um, I'm madly in love with MPS and this talk. So, uh, great. <laughs> great comment there. Um, the next question I have, uh, do the current popular opinions on animal, exp 
due to the current popular opinion on animal experimentation, is there a risk that MPS is introduced too quickly and that's, uh, that could result in uh, poor decisions about safety? Ultimately, could this lead to uh, potential human injury when new drugs are developed? I don't think so, um, because like I said earlier in the talk, the FDA, especially right now, will not approve a new drug without animals right now. And they're very carefully, um, you know, to some degree to the MPS developers frustration, um, considering how to weigh MPS data in a drug submission um, packet. But I will say that I think I want to say that a um, I don't know if this drug was already approved for other contexts of use and MPS were used solely, I think, um, for a different context of use, MPS data alone, which was pretty exciting for the field. But if anything, I think that, you know, the regulators, as usual, are gonna proceed slowly and carefully um, as they should with this matter. Um, they're really talking, they're being thoughtful about it. But if you look at how great, how great our animal models are predicting safety right now, our animal models are not necessarily great predictors. I mean, they're, they're, be they're better than nothing. They do a good job for some things. Um, but I actually really think we need MPS um, to help make drugs safer, that we have these human relevant tests early on, because as you saw with the liver example, the seizure example, the neural example, that sometimes our animal models are missing things um, because they're not, because of how our human organs process things are not the same. It's not necessarily conserved safety wise um, for certain organs. And that's been a real struggle um, for the um, research industry. So I don't, I'm not concerned about that. Um, I think that that things are going at an appropriate pace. Sometimes we wish that maybe it could go a little bit faster with MPS. There is suggestion Though, and our group is really saying that it shouldn't, that animal models should not necessarily be held as the gold standard, um, that rather MPS should be treated. Um, ultimately, our goal is for MPS to be treated the same way that a new animal model is treated, where it's really about the individual system, what it's being used for, the context of use, um, all of those factors, similar to how a new animal model um, might be qualified. Um, but again, it's, we're still early. Um, I think I think that these are going to be a really big benefit to human health and safety. Thank you. Um, a few participants ha have asked, um, will the uh, slides be shared or the presentation recorded? Yes, uh, with Dr. Uh, LaFalle's consent, we're recording this. So I will get it processed and out to everyone as, as soon as we can. So please be on the lookout um, for an additional email from me sometime soon. Um, also, I will add, um, if anybody is interested in learning more about our group's perspective on the regulatory status and pathway to regulatory acceptance for MPS, on our main webpage for MPS, you can see a recording of a talk that I did last summer at the MPS um, Virtual World Summit um, about this aspect. And it goes into more of this um, regulatory aspects of MPS use. Um, so yeah, if you want more, go listen to that talk or scrub through it quickly to get the overview. <laughs> Thank you. Um, comment in, in related to the um, previous question and your answer. Uh, how well animal models predict safety and efficacy depends on a lot of what we were talking about. Uh, in addition, there are not very many studies that have compared efficacy in animals and, and humans directly. So I, I don't know if uh, you wanted to comment on that comment. Um, no, I mean, I think that, I think that's a good comment. Yeah, there's, animals are not necessarily amazing predictors, and there are not, I know there are some publications looking at, you know, drugs that, that we thought were going to work in animals that were safe in animals, and then were, were not safe in humans. Um, and again, I showed uh, several, especially for liver toxicology, because that's, that's a really big issue right now. Um, where MPS are really quite productive, where they've, they've had really good success for predicting toxicity um, for, for liver, as well as honestly many other systems. Liver is kind of just the, 
the one of the go to examples. Um, Thank you. Uh, I have one more question in my queue here. So if anyone else would like to submit a question, please uh, do so now. Um, and the question is, uh, do you find any particular uh, microphysiological system type um, being more predictive? Are there any um, any scholarly research um, related to uh, that type of analysis? So to my knowledge, it it depends on what you're trying to predict. Some of the more simple models are still really good, just, you know, often to a very high degree, very predictive of toxicity, very predictive of efficacy for certain types of diseases, certain types of questions. The more complex microphysiological systems are going to be used for different kinds of questions. Um, and so it really, it just depends on what your questions are. And so we actually think that, um, for many end users, it might be really beneficial for them to even, again, just taking the liver example, because that's high in the mind, maybe taking both a less complex liver system to, you know, screen drugs initially or an, an answer initial questions because these systems are higher throughput. Um, they might be less expensive. They take less time. And then once you narrow down that um, potential drug package, maybe then you put it in the more complex um, MPS system. Again, very similar to how we don't start our research in non-human primates. We start in mice, we start in zebrafish, we do some basic research there, we get a good idea about what we think is going to happen, and then we move it into non-human primates. Um, and from what um, I really see with MPS, it's, it's the same in terms of complexity. Um, they really um, as I've learned more and more, they really have how you use them um, and just the field of it is really similar to the animal model field where there's a lot going on. Um, you know, t in some ways, this talk, you know, would be like, oh, talking about all animal research models. It's a broad topic. There's a lot going on. Um, it's a lot of the more in-depth questions are going to be depending on what you're interested in studying. Well, thank you, Megan. Um, one final comment. Uh, says I, I've, I've I've seen many talks uh, related to introductory MPS topics, and this was one of the best. So I'll, I'll leave the the Q and A session with, with that comment, and and thank you. Um, so let me uh, conclude. I, I have just a, a few more uh, closing slides, but before I do that, Megan, um, is there any place else you'd like to direct? Um, our audience today for, for more information. Yeah, so really the best place um, is going to be um, na3rc.org slash NPS, um, or you can just go to our homepage, scroll down, you know, look at our resources, replace an NPS. That's where you're going to see some of our resources um, related to NPS, that regulatory talk, our tech hub. Um, you can always reach out to me um, if you're interested in our group, um, if you're interested in learning more. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a real pleasure talking to you today. This, this definitely was one of the more challenging talks. This is the second time I've, second or third time I've given it. This is one of the more challenging talks um, since I do not have that background in NBS systems. But again, I think that's actually really beneficial for the viewers um, because I come from a very similar place than you. And so I've had to really think through, you know, how to how to communicate this. And really my home is in is in animal research. It's not necessarily in NPS, but I'm learning and growing and um, the developers have really helped so much me understand these technologies and the promise that they hold and their limitations and all of that. So I'm happy that I was able to share it with all of you today. Thank, Thank you. you. But our, our next webinar is uh, Next Steps After the NIH Working Group, Perspectives on Future Animal Research, Rigor, and Reporting. And it's being presented by Dr. Clara Hankinson, who is the Associate Vice Provost for Research and Executive Director of the University Laboratory Animal Research at the University of Pennsylvania. As always, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. LaFala and the North American 3Rs for their continued partnership in our 3Rs webinar series. You can learn more about the, the webinar series at the URL listed on the screen there, tinyurl.com slash 2021 NJABR3Rs. Uh, 
thank you to, to Megan and her team for the continued help and, and sharing the word uh, about these webinars. Also, thank you to uh, Dr. Cindy Buckmaster for her continued help in finding such great content for the series. Uh, if anybody has any questions, again, please feel free to reach out to me, um, reach at njabr.org. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you to uh, Dr. LaFollette for her participation today and to the North American 3Rs Collaborative. We will see you all again very soon. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.